Hi, I'm Susan Brown. I'm your trainer for the series on Bridging the Capital Access Gap. This 16 module series has five chapters and today we're in chapter one. And we're in module one, which is the lending landscape. So before we step into the lending landscape, I'd like to talk for a minute about the whole purpose of this training. And this training was designed to help uh, business development organizations like yours understand the products that lenders offer to small businesses and to help you prepare small businesses to better succeed at accessing capital. There's different types of lenders, and we want to show you the array of lenders and some of the products and, that they offer. And most importantly, we want to give you knowledge and skills so that you can help people who are normally left out of the financing arena to have better access to capital. This series will help you get more information to either enhance your existing services or create new services. But what we want to acknowledge here is that financing is hard. It's a technical subject and it has a lot of factors. And so what we're suggesting here is that you sit down with your staff and review all 16 modules, then have a discussion where you look at where do we want to focus? Where do we have existing skills in our organization? Where do we have gaps in our skill set? And given all this information in this 16 part series, what could we do to enhance our existing services? And that may take some time, even after you watch all these, it does take time and effort to, to have a really complete financial access program in your organization. Okay, so let's jump into the lending landscape now. And what we're gonna cover in this module is we're gonna spend a little time talking about some inequality that exists in the financing sector. And then I'm gonna go over all these different lenders that you see listed there. I also want to point out that there's a much more in-depth report that's part of this module that I strongly recommend you download and read and get all the details that are available in that very excellent report to orient you towards the entire lending landscape in detail. So what inspired this training? Well, it partly was inspired because there is inequality in access to capital in our country. And even though entrepreneurship is a an opportunity for uh, improving oneself, improving one's circumstances in our country, it doesn't mean that it's the same landscape for everybody when they step into that arena. And we have a pre-existing landscape of wealth, income, credit, and asset inequality that is an important difference in how business ownership and capital access works. And it impacts the outcomes different individuals achieve as they start businesses. So we want to spend a little time looking at disparities in net worth, one critical factor in inequality. And this information comes from the National Community Reinvestment Coalition and the Federal Reserve. So you see the title of this slide is Median Net Worth by Race in 2019. Net worth is another word for wealth. And the way you calculate net worth is you take everything you own, the value of everything you own, your house, your car, your savings accounts, and you subtract any outstanding debt that you have, and that is your net worth. Another word for it is equity. And what you see on this slide is that these are the average or median net worth by race in our country in 2019. White families had a net worth of about $190,000, Black families about $25,000, Hispanic families $40,000, and mixed race families about $75,000. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a, a bit of a heartbreaking slide to look at and to see how much inequality there is in our country. And what you need to understand is that the people in the first column, when they walk into a bank, are going to re be received and assessed quite differently than those in the other columns. And part of what we're trying to do with this curriculum is even that up to help the folks that have these generational inequalities have a better shot at accessing capital. So the reason this inequality in wealth is so important when we're talking about accessing capital is that most business owners start and grow their businesses for the first several years based on personal credit and resources. So that when you're walking in the door with much less than somebody else, it's going to be much harder to start a business and access capital. So as you see in the slide that in 2020, 88% of firms use their owner's credit score to start the business. For firms of $100,000 in debt, a majority use the personal financial resources as collateral, which means if you own a house or you have big trucks that are paid off or something like that, you're going to be much better positioned to back a loan and be supported by a bank. 
And given the racial and gender wealth, income, and credit gap, women and people of color face considerable disadvantage when accessing capital for entrepreneurship. And we don't have a slide on gender, but you would see that the racial divide happens along gender and between men and women. And if you add gender and race together, it gets more and more extreme in terms of wealth gap. So now that we've covered the purpose of this training, let's dive into the lending landscape and start with community banks. So what is a community bank? A community bank is a small regional bank, usually with a state charter, that has uh, a limited number of branches, perhaps a few dozen branches. And I want to contrast that to very large nationally chartered banks that have thousands of branches throughout the country. And you were thinking about the big banks like Wells Fargo, Chase, Bank of America. Those are your big national banks. Community banks, on the other hand, are state chartered, have a few branches in your area. And what's great about community banks is that they have a regional focus. They are more likely to be have personal relationships with their customers. Decision-making is more local and regional to your area. And they generally step in and provide capital to start up businesses much more readily than the big banks. So when you're thinking about where to send your clients for banking, do some research, find out where the, who the community banks are in your, in your area and start there as a first place to look for capital for your clients. So we're going to talk about other sources of lending, other types of lenders further on, but I just want to emphasize that banks are important, even if it's sometimes hard to get in the door, because banks have the vast majority of capital in our country compared to the other types of lenders. So as you see there that in 2021, if you had 45% and 49%, 95% of small business owners that got capital got it from banks because that's, that's where the money is. So this training is a lot about helping you get in the door of the banks with your clients. That third bullet is that although these are not designed for business purposes, most small businesses are started with funds borrowed by the owner using certain kinds of personal credit uh, products and resources. So sometimes I hear people say, oh, you're not supposed to use your personal money to start a business. And I say, no, that's the American way. We start businesses in this country using personal credit, personal consumer products often. So we're talking credit cards, home mortgages, second mortgages, things like that to start businesses. So again, figuring out what products are at the bank, how to get into banks with your customers will do a tremendous service in terms of getting capital access to your customers. So the next type of lender that's a great option for your clients are credit unions. And credit unions are membership-based financial organizations, so they have great customer service. Now, many credit unions don't offer a lot of business products, but as we said on the last slide, it's okay because most young, small business owners that are looking for relatively small amounts of capital can use personal and consumer credit resources and products to start their businesses. So be sure to ask your clients if they belong to a credit union, and if they do, send them there and start learning what options are available at the local credit union. So the next lender I want to talk about are CDFIs. These are Community Development Finance Institutions. They get certified by the Treasury Department. They're generally, not all, but they're generally nonprofit organizations that are mission-led and are created to serve disadvantaged communities and individuals in their area. Because they're mission-led, they're willing to take more risk. They're less profit-focused. They can subsidize their operations with grants. And they are often created for the very purpose of helping people that many of you, I think, serve with your organizations. They provide flexible terms. They often provide technical assistance. If your client gets in trouble with repayment and is having some problems with delinquency, they're more flexible on how to work that out with fewer penalties. And they're open to working with all kinds of people. They're very aware of this inequality that we talked about earlier in this presentation, and they're here to address it. They are not equally distributed across our country. There are some states that have lots of them and some states that have very few. So on the next slide, I'll show you how to find the CDFIs in your community. So this is a screenshot from an organization called the Opportunity Finance Network. And that is the trade association for CDFIs in our country. And you can go look and see what ones are near you. These are some of the best places you can go for capital for your clients. Finance companies is the next type of lender I want to talk about. 
And the most common use of this, you'll see on this slide, there's various kinds of products listed, but the most common one, I think, for people that we are trying to serve is to buy a vehicle for their business or some large equipment. And when I bought my first brand new car, I financed it with financing available from the manufacturer. And that's a common thing that manufacturers of cars and large equipment offer financing to make it accessible to people. So if you have a client in that circumstance, this might be a good option for them. FinTech, online lenders. If you Google this, you'll see hundreds. These have proliferated in the last 10 years and there's hundreds or thousands of options out there online. And these are technology companies that instead of having a brick and mortar location, are just offering capital online. And there's lots of variations out there. The biggest benefit to these is they've made it extraordinarily easy to apply and they can get people capital extremely quickly, um, which is nice, but here's the caveat. They can be very, very poorly structured. High interest rates, they can set up loans where they're taking capital or cash directly out of the checking account, which is okay. I pay my mortgage directly on my checking account, but they might be taking it out every day or every few days. And these kinds of structures end up with very high interest rates, sucking capital out of a business and can totally undermine cash flow, profits, and viability. So if you're not familiar with fintech companies and how their products are structured, it's very important you do some research before you refer anyone to them. One place I like to go is NerdWallet. NerdWallet tends to keep quite up to date on small business online lenders and will public publicize the rates. So I think the link in the slide will take you to an article that has the five top 10, five or 10 online lenders, but you'll be surprised when they say the best online lenders, one of them will have interest rates of up to 99%, which really knocks your socks off. So if this is an area that's new to you, definitely do research before referring anyone there. The other thing I want to point out in the bubble there on this slide, there's an amazing article, a research paper done by Axion Opportunity Fund called Unaffordable and Unsustainable. They saw dozens of hundreds of their clients coming in the door with these merchant cash advance loans that were wiping out their cash flow. And they did a study on it and really spelled out what the how detrimental these loans are. So please read that, do your online research and work with clients that have unfortunately fallen into the trap of some of these online lenders to help get them out. Sometimes these can be refinanced, but you'll see in that Axion Opportunity Fund report, sometimes people get in so deep they're beyond refinancing. So this is a really important area to get more information on and know how to direct clients about. Crowdfunding. Yay, crowdfunding. It sounds like a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. It's kind of free money a little bit because it means funding a project by raising small amounts from a lot of different people. For our purposes, there's lots of different crowdfunding modalities, but what we're talking about here is reward or donation-based crowdfunding, where in, in exchange for a small amount of money, you give someone some kind of special insider reward. And so this can be a lot of fun. It's a great opportunity for businesses that already have or can build a large online following. I worked with a a guy who is a beer master, I think that's what you call it. He worked for a, a microbrew and had a following because people loved his beer. They loved his formulas. And he wanted to go out and start his own um, microbrew with, and be an independent and do, be the, the head cheese at his own place. And he had hundreds of people that were willing to follow him to his new business. And I told him, you are a candidate for crowdfunding because you already have a following. So if you've got somebody who's really engaged on that level, crowdfunding might be an option. And again, the only downside about this is crowdfunding is deceptively uh, time consuming. You have to spend time planning a campaign, and then it takes several months usually to implement the campaign and reach your financial goals. So if you want to do this with clients, get educated yourself on what it really takes to have a successful crowdfunding campaign, and then create some kind of process to help lead your clients through it. The Small Business Administration offers loans. Now, just so you know, the Small Business Administration, for the most part, doesn't directly do loans. It works through intermediaries. And it has three main loan products for businesses. Microloans, up to 50000 The Community Advantage 7A loans are often done by CDFIs and banks. And depending on which institution, up to 250000 or $5 million. And then that bottom bullet refers to 504 programs, which are 
usually very large commercial real estate projects. You can go to the SBA website and look for the intermediaries doing these loans in your area. When I was teaching the small business development course, everybody in there wanted to find an angel investor. And I know it's exciting and it seems very promising. The clients we are working with aren't probably great candidates for venture capital. The vast majority of venture capital in this country is investing in equity. And what that means is venture capitalists buy some ownership in the business as opposed to lend money to the business. And the businesses, you've seen that second bullet there, that businesses with extremely high growth potential are usually the ones that receive equity financing from venture capital firms. So we're talking tech startups and things like that. So the most likely venture capital our clients are going to get are from friends and family and loved ones. So this is a conversation to have with your clients about what the opportunities are there and maybe bring them down to ground about what the realities are about equity venture capital. So this slide and the next slide provide a nice recap of all the lenders and the lending landscape that we've talked about. You can find this recap in the, the bigger report that I referred to at the beginning. And it's a tool you can use with your staff or clients if you want a nice shorthanded way of discussing the options with everyone. So now you've got an idea of some of the places that you can send your clients to to access capital. The rest of the series that we've provided for you will start digging into some of the details of how to actually succeed getting capital out of those lenders. What we also do is provide some behind the scenes information. One of the things when I work with technical assistance providers, business development organizations that are coaching small business owners on the ground, and they've sent applications into lenders and find them getting declined and they don't know why. Part of what this training will do for you is give you some, a little bit of behind the scenes information about how lenders make decisions so that you're better prepared to Prepare your clients and get a yes out of a lender so that you're not confused or wondering how you get to yes with, with a lender. And this series, if you listen to all the modules, I think will do a tremendous amount in helping you with the details of a successful loan application. So thanks for joining me on The Lending Landscape, and I look forward to seeing you on the next module, When to Borrow.